Well, Gwen, can we move now um, to 1924 and Romeo and Juliet? That came afterwards, after we did Back to Methuselah, <clears throat> then to my absolute, complete joy, uh, Alias said we were going to do Romeo and Juliet. And we did it in Birmingham first, and uh, it was, uh, I thought, absolutely wonderful to be doing it. And I lived with Juliet ever since I was 14. I, I really had thought about her and... Oh, I, it, it was my dream that, that, uh, that someday I thought that if I could only play Juliet. So that was it, and I did play Juliet. And your interpretation and was uh, hailed because it was the first childlike Juliet that people That's had right, seen. although I wasn't uh, by any means a child, but I did look very young, so that I was able to play the earlier scenes. But because I'd had very good training and also training in voice production so that I could do the big speeches with the technical equipment, which a very young actress wouldn't have, no very young actress really can accomplish those tremendous, big, emotional climaxes in the second half of the play. And that is the difficulty with Juliet. That's why the old saying always was, no actress can play Juliet until she's old enough to play the nurse. That was always said. There's a certain amount of truth in it. You've got to have a certain number of experience of life. It isn't until you are a little older that you know how to be young, in a way. Gwen's Juliet was a huge success, and Jackson transferred the play to London, where a new Romeo had to be found. And I remember thinking, I wonder who's going to be the Romeo. I had seen uh, that first production of the insect play, and a certain young man called Gilgood had played the butterfly, and I hadn't really thought very much of him, actually. When I heard that he was going to be Romeo, I really was rather dashed, and thought, oh, yeah, well, I'd be. And I came down to the, uh, the first rehearsal and uh, was waiting to go on and I always changed into a long skirt because that was the thing that I thought always when I rehearsed a period play, I liked to get into something that gave me the feeling of, you know, not a modern thing, but, you know, a certain amount of costume. And so I was there in my long sort of dress waiting to go on and I suddenly heard um, uh, this young man uh, doing a friar scene with Friar Lawrence, Campbell Gullen, who was lovely in the part. And there was Johnny, of course, speaking it like an angel, of course, with <laughs> born Terry, you didn't have to tell him how to do it. Oh, I remember thinking, oh, that's all right. <laughs> and I was absolutely blissfully happy from that on. We worked together, and, and he's sweeter he's about me. He says I helped him a lot. Well, I know it was very easy to help, and uh, it was a great success. In 1925, Philip Ridgway, who was at that time running the Barnes Theatre, asked Gwen to play Tess in Tess of the D'Urbervilles, in a version that Thomas Hardy had adapted some years ago from his novel. Gwen was summoned to Hardy's house, Max Gate, to meet the great man and get his approval. I remember being more than a little apprehensive, and then suddenly coming, tripping across the lawn, was an apple-cheeked, white-haired, bright-of-eye little old gentleman, uh, to greet us, and this was Thomas Hardy, quite, quite different from what I had imagined him at all. He had a puckish sense of humour. He was quite delightful, he was quite enchanting. We very soon made great friends, and um, very tentatively, I began to talk about the script. I talked about the book first, and then made some tentative suggestions that perhaps in the script, it wasn't quite as good as it was in the book. Oh, said Hardy, oh, you, you, you know the book. And so I said, yes, 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 yes. So when he found that I could quote chapter and verse uh, uh, in the book of the, something that he'd written in the script, which was not as good, and he said, oh, yes, 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 well, anything uh, that's in the book, of course, of course, you change every, every, anything you like. And I was then given more or less permission to uh, take away a lot of the r rather sort of theatrical, old-fashioned writing of the script, which he subsequently told me uh, he had uh, written, oh, many years, it was just after the, the book was written, he'd written it for Sarah Bernhardt, who would have been a very strange test, yes. <laughs> and that's how it happened. The play duly opened at Barnes. 
But Hardy, now in his 80s, was too frail to travel to London to see it. So Philip Ridgway decided to take the play to him at Max Gade. So one Sunday we, uh, we packed ourselves up. We couldn't take the scenery, of course, but we took all the costumes and the whole company went down and we gave a performance in the back drawing room at Max Gate for Mr Hardy and his wife and the doctor. I think a couple of reporters were let in at the back <laughs> and the servants. And I remember thinking it'll be terrible, it'll be terrible, we shan't be able to get any quality into it at all. How can we do it? Um, and of course there was it was just, it was a double drawing room, uh, the, 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 as you had in those days, uh, and, and we could play in the inner uh, parts, and it made a little sort of stage. I suppose we mimed all the, all the props, I think we did. We did have our costumes, but one thing that was wonderful was Angel and I were able to play the big confession scene on the wedding night just as it might have been sitting by that fire, in the firelight, with just one lamp and a couple of candles. And one didn't have to project. It was, it was, I mean, it, when, you, when you're in, in films or on television, you don't have to project, you could do it, but you've got lights and camera and all that. We had nothing. We had absolute reality. And it was the only time in the whole of uh, my life on the, in the theatre that I've ever felt I simply wasn't in this world at all. I was Tess in that room with Angel. And it was real. It was really happening. And I can remember that one of the reporters said to me afterwards that they were watching at the back and he said as if we were watching, it wasn't a thing of the theatre at all, it was watching a scene that was happening and we almost thought we shouldn't be there, it was so private. It was a great experience and I've never forgotten it. And the old man, he was an old man, was sitting there and I was told afterwards the tears were just trickling down his face. After her success as Tess, there followed a period that Gwen describes as flat, plenty of work, but no challenges. Her career didn't seem to be progressing. And then her great friend, Edith Evans, told her that the time had come for her to stop being an exquisite china figurine and persuaded her to play Lady Herbert of Lee opposite her Florence Nightingale in The Lady with the Lamp. The part required Gwen to age from 18 to 80, and she did this with spectacular success, and the play revealed her as an actress of depth and maturity. This was followed by one of her most famous parts, Elizabeth Barrett Browning in The Barretts of Wimpole Street. Her moving portrayal was acclaimed by critics and audiences alike, and it firmly established Gwen as one of England's most successful leading ladies. It was at this time that she met the painter Richard Sickert, who had admired her performance in Precious Bane and invited her to lunch. So I went to uh, have lunch with Richard Sickert and his wife, Therese Lessor. And uh, he was in the habit of lunching in the King's Cross um, restaurant. I suppose it was a very good restaurant in those days, uh, at King's Cross. That was where he had a table and um, we had lunch. And he said the reason that he had uh, written to me was because I was the only actress that he'd ever seen who knew how to beat up a pudding as if she knew what she was doing. And that was the beginning of my friendship with Richard Sickert, and he was the most entrancing man. Did you ever go to his studio? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Well, the thing that, was, uh, that sparked him off, he was determined to um, paint my portrait. And I said, oh, no, I can't sit. I'm, I'm no good at sitting. I get it. It comes out all wrong. He said, I don't want you to sit. I don't want you to sit. He said, I know your face better than you know it yourself. But he said, I'd like to have a, I've got any snapshot of yourself, any picture. He didn't want a studio portrait. No, that was no good at all. What he wanted was a snapshot. And then I remembered that when I had played um, my first, uh, the first thing after The Immortal R that I actually did at all was to play Queen Isabella, the wolf, the she-wolf, 
uh, France in Edward II for a special performance. And Bertram Park had done a snap of me in this wonderful golden crinoline, uh, looking like a, a 15th century Italian painting. Uh, and he, and I kept this snap and secret for it. He said, that's it. So he took that snap and from that he painted this great picture, which was subsequently sold to the Tate, of Isabella the She-Wolf.